I want to talk to you today about a great feminist campaigner who built the Women's Cooperative Guild into a very influential voice of working class women and at the same time help working class women through the Guild to build their own uh, uh, self-esteem and to uh, and and to get in in the process uh, a voice for their concerns. I was reminded of this woman um, a few weeks ago when uh, when I received a copy of this uh, wonderful biography of Margaret Llewellyn Davies. So, uh, if you're interested, there's something for you to look at in the future. So, uh, a late Victorian, she was very, very well thought of in the cooperative movement, as you can see by that quote from. Uh, from uh, GDH called the Cooperative Historian. She was the General Secretary of the Women's Cooperative Guild for uh, more than 30 years. And in the time that she was General Secretary, she grew the organization, and it, the figures are there at the bottom of that, screen, of that slide, from 1,800 members to 51,000 members um, in the time that she was General Secretary. So she was a, a superb organiser and a superb camp campaigner in so many ways. Uh, in her, um, this is a, a photograph of Margaret the Warren Davis uh, in her youngest, uh, younger years. She was the only girl in a family of seven, but the, normally in a, in a Victorian family, the girl would, would have had a particular role uh, and it, it wouldn't have been very inclusive. The boys would have got the opportunities in a middle class family to go to university. And she got exactly the same opportunities as the boys. So they were, um, they were very well connected with, uh, with people in the uh, radical um, Victorian movements. Her aunt was uh, uh, Emily Davies, her father's sister, and she set up Girton College, Cambridge for women. And Margaret did go to uh, to study there. Although she didn't graduate, she certainly she certainly spent spent some time. So she was a first wave feminist, absolutely, and uh, uh, who who worked uh, uh, for many many years uh, for universal suffrage, and a massive campaigner for the poor. So she was elected um, after just uh, three or four years in the Co-op uh, co Guild um, as General Secretary. Now, the Guild had uh, three main aims. And um, uh, the, the first aim really was to, uh, to spread the advantages of belonging to and shopping at the, at the local cooperative, cooperative societies. Um, they wanted to improve the condition of, the, uh, of the, their members and they were essentially um, of working class women membership. In fact, it was the first organisation uh, specifically for working class women. And, uh, and through their organisation, they, the, they got the practice of, of, uh, of chairing meetings, of speaking, public speaking, um, of, uh, of campaigning uh, and um, uh, each cooperative society, so in, in our area, uh, the, the Chessie Street Cooperative Society would have had uh, three committees, a management committee uh, for running of the, of the store um, that was almost always made up of men, an education committee because of course education was always an important part of, of a cooperative, um, not just education on uh, uh, on, on co-op ideals and so on, but on all sorts of aspects of life. Uh, and the third committee, uh, the Women's Guild. And that's a, a standard um, uh, symbol, uh, basically, of the, of the Cooperative Women's Guild. There's the woman with the basket. Uh, although she did, she, initially, they didn't, she didn't have much power. She certainly had the spending power when it came to, to where she was shopping and how she was shopping. Now, her father was a, a vicar in the um, Church of England, and he was moved from a very poor parish in London to, uh, to uh, Kirby Lonsdale in Westmoreland. And um, uh, 
Margaret Lewan Davies set up her office there and ran the Women's Cooperative Guild alongside her lifelong partner, who she met in Kirby Lonsdale, um, Lillian Harris, and they had their uh, they had their office in the rectory in Kirby Lonsdale. I think there's now a blue plaque there. When, when I saw it a few years ago, I thought it would be really great to have to have a blue plaque. And I did talk to some uh, Lancashire um, uh, members about the possibility. Now, I did say that uh, she was a great campaigner and um, uh, each year uh, they identified one particular campaign uh, that they were going to get involved in. Uh, one of her um, ambitions really was to take cooperation to the very poorest um, in society. And she got the uh, agreement of the Sunderland um, Co-op uh, Co Society to set up a poor store in one of the poorest parts of Sunderland um, uh, in a street called Coronation Street uh, down in the docks. And from there, they set up a store that sold small quantities of food that people could afford, not packets of tea, but little, uh, little twists of tea and, um, uh, uh, and smaller bags of flour and those sorts of things. But they also had um, they sold uh, hot soup uh, because a lot of uh, homes in the area didn't have cooking facilities. And they, would you believe it, they sold 160 gallons of peace pudding every day. Now, if anyone's interested and would like to read more about this wonderful um, uh, campaign to get cooperation into the, in, into the poor, then you'll see that in an article that I wrote in um, 2012 in the Northeast Labour History Journal. Um, so on this photograph, there's two little girls, and we used uh, this photograph to advertise what we've been doing as part of the uh, Northeast Labour History Popular Politics Project. There's little girls, are Ethel and Lizzie Byrne, and Ethel and Lizzie Byrne's uh, granddaughters came back to me and said that they'd recognise their, their mothers, sorry, their grandmothers, um, from the photograph in the Sunderland, uh, Sunderland Echo. Uh, and they've gone from being very, very poor children who used to uh, sell furniture backwards and forwards across the river at Sunderland. Uh, and I think that she said that one of her cousins was a millionaire now, so that, that they moved on quite substantially. So, uh, so there's a photograph of the, the neighbours, because as I said, they, had, uh, they set up the store, but it wasn't just a store. It was also a settlement with a, a large hall where they could run classes. Uh, they had a, a penny bank for the children. Uh, the, there was a settlement rooms for, for, uh, two, uh, for two guild workers. Uh, and they were women's guild workers but, uh, and promoting the women's guild and getting women to join in, but also social workers. And that little quote came from uh, the, the exercise book that that I did see down at the uh, London School of Economics in Margaret Llewellyn Davies collection there. And uh, it, it was really a, a record of uh, people's living conditions because um, they, they lived amongst the people and they called them their neighbors uh, and they wanted to empower them as well as to make changes. Um, no more so than, uh, than the maternity and, uh, uh, and infant care campaigns that they run. Um, and using the experience of their guild members, uh, they put together, uh, Margaret Llewellyn Davis put together this book, No One But A Woman Knows. And they used their experiences um, uh, of over 300 guild members uh, publishing the, the de the, their depressing experience of of um, work class women who were exhausted by a succession of births and miscarriages. Um, they could see that they needed much better uh, help for, uh, for working class families, uh, better uh, health care, they wanted um, school clinics, and they weren't alone in this because there were other uh, women's organisations working to the same kind of aims at the time. 
Um, and you can see there the, the, uh, the different campaigns that they were involved in for school clinics, maternity benefits. Um, they wanted equal treatment for married and unmarried mothers and uh, removal of the stigma of illegitimacy. They also were campaigning for birth control because they could see how necessary that was. And that was not a very popular campaign, for, certainly um, in other women's organisations and the labour movement, because they were too frightened of upsetting um, people's sensibilities and, and religious feelings. But, uh, but she certainly could see that that, that, would be the, that that would be one thing that if married women got the advice or uh, any woman got, got the advice uh, that was needed to, uh, to, to prevent unwanted pregnancies, what a difference it could make to the health of the mother and the health of the family. Um, uh, another uh, campaign that they ran uh, that also got uh, uh, that got lots of lots of support from um, from working class women, but um, that it also came up, up against a lot of opposition uh, was the um, the need to reform the divorce laws. And basically, what she uh, and the Women's Guild wanted they wanted the same kind of opportunities for working class women that middle class women got. You know, they they could afford to to get birth control advice. They could have they could afford to get the, the advice for and, and the proper food for their for their children and the, the good milk and all of that sort of thing. They could afford a divorce. So she wanted um, help um, to make divorces uh, uh, cheaper, uh, and she also wanted to um, increase the number of grounds that, that you could have for gaining a divorce. It was very limited. Uh, uh, men and women weren't treated e uh, equally in this situation. So, uh, the, but the one, the one uh, reform that she was very eager to have was to have, uh, um, have divorce by mutual consent. So if, uh, if the husband and wife agreed that the marriage was over, end it, right? Um, and if you look at the bottom of that slide, it says that uh, that they finally got legal aid um, to go to divorce in 1949, and uh, they finally got divorced by mutual consent in 1969. So there we are. Um, in addition to those uh, campaigns that were going to make a, a difference to working class women's lives, uh, they also wanted to improve conditions uh, for people working in the co-ops uh, and they believed that the co-op should put its own house in order if they're going to be a good influence to uh, the rest of society. So they were looking for equal pay for equal work, um, that, they, uh, that they encouraged all women to become members of the trade union uh, and they promoted uh, the, the trade union membership. Um, they uh, were advocating a minimum wage um, and they finally got that in 1912 and um, and that all women should be on uh, the appropriate scale and that was done by 1914. Uh, in addition to that they campaigned against uh, sweated labour and in in the kind of best tradition of the co-ops it was a co-op movement who um, who really advocated the fair trade uh, deal so they didn't just want um, better conditions for uh, for home workers, but they also wanted better conditions um, in, the, in the suppliers uh, uh, across the world. So in conclusion, I would say that Margaret Llewellyn Davies was a woman who was way ahead of her time. So uh, while they pressed, while they were pressing in the early years of, um, of the 20th century, for equal pay. We didn't get equal pay until 1970. We didn't get a minimum wage until 1998. Uh, we didn't get that mutual consent for divorce until 1969, legal aid for divorce, 1949. Family allowances that they were pushing for, we didn't get until 1945. Birth control on the National Health Service, 1961. School clinics in Durham, and I don't know about elsewhere, but I know that in Durham, uh, the, the, the uh, Durham uh, being a, a, a labour control local authority, started to introduce school clinics with volunteers in the 1920s. 
So as you can see, she was, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a, a terrific woman, socialist, cooperator, suffragist, trade unionist, radical social reformer, a really effective campaigner, great administrator. So uh, one of my heroes. Thank you.